I never, I never even thought about the horizon rising the eye level thing was a big deal. I mean, I never thought about it, but from the first day in formation training, you know, you're looking at the other airplane and your instructor goes, if he's above the horizon, you're below him. If he's below the horizon, you're above him. If he's on the horizon, you're level. 100% fact all the time. Hi, folks. So that was Mike just speaking, and Mike is a retired F-16 fighter pilot, and that was part of an interview that he did with Ben from Taboo Conspiracy and Bob from Globusters, probably over a year ago now. Um, I've been wanting to make a video to follow that up for quite a while, and just got around to it, so I'm going to be inputting some of the numbers that Mike talked about into AutoCAD, see how they work out on a globe Earth, um, so I hope you enjoy. You know, I never considered even about flat Earth, right? I mean, it was just a it was just a plain fact for for us was if he is on the horizon, then you are level with him. If he is above the horizon, then you've got the horizon down there. That's level. He's above you if he's above the horizon, and if he's below, it's below. I mean, it's 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 that simple. But I, I never even really considered that it's not something i'd come across in any of the stuff that i'd watch and had been watching but you get to thinking about it and go well geez yeah if you go up above a ball the horizon is going to be down there if you go right. up above well, a big vast flat earth then it's going to stay at eye level because of perspective so if i'm looking out there and i see this guy and i've got a td box a target designation box comes up in the hud what i'm locked on I can pull my nose to him and look out there and try to get my eyeballs on him. So, because at 20 miles, you're not seeing the guy yet. You know, you're not going to see him till probably, depending on the conditions, I don't even remember really, but probably 12 miles at the most, you're not seeing a guy out there at 20 miles. Okay, so in AutoCAD, I've drawn a circle with a radius of 3,959. If I zoom in right to the top, You'll see that I've drawn a blue band around the entire circumference of this circle, and that band has an offset of 10,000 feet. So the top of that blue band is 10,000 feet. And if I zoom right in, you'll see I've drawn an F-16 with its nose dead on 10,000 feet. From the nose of the um, F-16, there's this dotted line that extends out here. I'm going to select that is the line to the horizon as seen from that F16 and that is all the way over here this point here which if I hover on top of it tells me is 122.4737 miles incidentally the angle down from horizontal to the horizon is 1.8 degrees so that's how far the pilot would have to dip his head down um, to look dead at the horizon. Okay, so Mike said that it's unlikely you're going to see an enemy aircraft um, beyond 12 miles. So I've drawn a distance of 12 miles from the first F-16, which is here, and I've placed another one dead on the horizon. Now, if you remember what Mike said, that um, anything above the horizon is above you, anything below the horizon is below you, anything on the horizon is at the same level as you. Okay, so this is on the horizon, but it's definitely not at the same level as the other F-16. In fact, it is at 7,920 feet, not 10,000 feet. So there's a mismatch there straight away. Okay, let's carry on, um, and Mike's going to explain about the radar systems within the F-16s and how they also debunk the globe. Well, this radar on the Viper is a plus from it, it's got a huge scan volume, right? Plus or minus 60 of the nose left and right, and four bars up and down. They call it plus or minus 64 bar or plus or minus 32 bar, whatever, right? So these four bars are the scanning bars, like, and I'm pretty sure, but I would have to, this is 20, even 
like my training in F-16s was over 30 years ago. So uh, take some of this with a grain of salt, but I'm pretty sure that like your radar, you can see my fingers, right? Mm -hmm. the, your radar is like a flashlight beam, right? Yes. It, it radiates out. It's this slightly light. divergent. And I guess in a cone or it, really in Doppler radars, it's more like a, a square maybe. But at any rate, it's like this. And I think this is 30 degrees, mm -hmm. right? So four bar would be, it starts up here, 60 degrees to the left, scans over, 60 degrees to the right, drops down one bar, which would be 30 degrees, right? Scans back. So the bottom is basically at your nose. It's it's level if you got the L strobe in the notch in the center. It scans back. That's so you've got the upper 60 degrees covered, right? To mm -hmm. twice at 30 degrees. Then it drops down another 30, scans back, all the way back over to right 60. Then it drops down again, scans back to drop that other 60 degrees. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 120 degrees this way and 120 degrees this way. This way, I'm not positive about, but I'm almost positive. Okay, so that's a huge search volume, right? That's, mm -hmm. if you go the right, and there's ranges that you set in the radar. You can set it at 10, you can set it at 20, you can set it at 40, you can set it at 80. It even goes out farther than that. I think 120 but it may have been once yet. I don't recall exactly, right? Mm -hmm. But we typically ran it out at 40 miles because being careful what I say, a fighter sized target is probably not going to show up beyond the 40 mile range, okay? Just suffice it to say that. We are here. We are pointing that way, and this is a top down display. The range scale on the right here 0, 10. 20, 30, 40 nautical miles controlled by this range here. Currently 40 miles, could be 80, could be 20. So we can also increase the scale by going up like that and down like that. Next is our azimuth display, currently set to 60 A6. That means it will scan 60 degrees to the right of us, 60 degrees to the left of us. We can have 30 left, 30 right. The limits shown by this line here and here, or 10 either way. We can then move the acquisition cursor around and the limits of what the radar will display will be shown between these lines here. These guys, as you'll see, we will lose contact with them and the white bricks will disappear because they're no longer in our scan azimuth. Speed up and they're gone. Repopulate, let's say A30 I like to use generally and you'll see that these targets will start to repopulate. In terms of our elevation of scan, it's measured in bars. Each bar is about six or seven degrees, I think. Currently four bars, so there's about 20 something degrees of total elevation coverage. You can change that to one bar, two bars, four bars. I tend to leave it at four bars for general purpose, but if you want to speed up the scan refresh rate, you can reduce the number of bars, but just beware that you also reduce the elevation of coverage of your radar by doing that. So we pretty much ran, if you're just fully scanning, not really going in, going to fight, you're running plus or minus 64 bar, both both your you and your wingman and the other element if you've got a four ship, right? Everybody's around that, just keeping it wide open. So typically our engagements, you would have the red, your adversary, we call them red air and we're blue air. We're, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. They would split off and they would go to a point at least 40 miles away downrange from you. And this is all in protected airspace, right? You would have blocks, altitude blocks for blue air is zeros and fours, uh, red air is five to nines, right? That means like from 10,000 to 14,000 feet is my airspace. There's a, it skips a thousand feet and goes five to nine. So the blue or red air is in five to nine, 15 to 19. And then it would skip another thousand feet. I've got a block up at 20 to 24 and so on. I got a block at 30 to 34 if I've got the airspace up there. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So everything all sorted out so that when we come at each other at 12 to 1500 miles an hour, then until you have complete SA on where everybody is, you don't leave your block. You stay in your block until you, if you go into a bad guy block, you got to know where everybody is, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you're fighting 2v2 or 2v4 or 4v4 or whatever, you kind of need to keep track of where everybody is. And that's the hard part. Air, air is hard. Anyway, 
So the radar, you hit this 40 mile set, right? <clears throat> Everybody has a search responsibility. I'll just say that it's we're we're in a two B four, okay? Two of me versus four of them, right? Mm -hmm. We're separated by 40 miles. We're gonna push, which means we're gonna fights on, fights on. They they come in of whatever formation they're gonna come in, and we're gonna do our tactics to defeat what their formation is. Anyway, so because of this plus or minus 64 bar takes a really long time and we're coming at each other so fast, you want to reduce your scopes coverage down so that it covers it faster so you can find them quicker, right? Does that make sense? Generally speaking, it is not a good idea to max your radar out. It's not a good idea, generally speaking, to have 60 degrees left, 60 degrees right, and four bars because the refresh rate is very slow. Look how long it takes this azimuth carrot to go left and right, and look how long it takes this to go up and down. It makes very poor radar performance. Best thing, I think, is to set at A3, and then if you need a very fast track, then you can bring the bars down if you want. That's how I suggest using the radar on the F-16. So what we would typically do is, I got my wingman line of breast a mile away from me, right? He's over there, I'm over here. We split the scope down the middle, so I got plus or minus 30 here, and I'm searching, say, surface to 20,000 feet. Yeah, that works better. I'm probably going to leave it in four bar if it's just a two ship. If it's a four ship, then we can split it into two bar and we can search quadrants of the sky, right? So right. we divide the, the sky up into quadrants and move the radar to where it makes sense. Okay, here's where the radar mechanics works. Because I want to search high, right? I'm just doing two bar up high. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to search from, say we're at uh, the bottom of our block, 10,000 feet. I'm going to search 10,000 feet and above, and I want my wingman to search 10,000 feet and below, right? So you do this knob on the on the throttle. It's called the L-strobe, elevation whatever strobe. You can roll the, th roll the radar search volume up so that there's a number on the cursor, right? The bottom number is the lowest bit. So I'm, if I'm searching 10,000 and above, I'm on, and I'm at 10,000 feet, then the bottom number on the on the cursor is going to say 10,000. Now it's searching up here, right? Mm -hmm. So I got 10,000 and above. So <clears throat> I don't expect to see anybody out there at 40 miles below 10,000 feet. What is that telling you now? I'm at 10,000 feet. I got the lowest part of my radar looking above 10,000 feet at 40 miles. But mm -hmm. because I just ran my cursor out there and I set it there. What happened to the curvature between me and 40 miles? I would really be searching higher than that, right? If, if I set the cursor, the bottom of my cursor, Le basically level with the nose of my airplane. Can you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I there and I run that all the way out to where to 40 miles that the numbers change because the, the search volume gets bigger, but just the upper number is going to change because I've got this bottom set, right? Right. So the, because it's, you know, 60 degrees higher, you know, so the volume is higher out there. But that bottom number doesn't change. I roll it all the way up to 40 miles. It ought to be this product down. ought to be dropping That's or right. higher. Because Otherwise, if it didn't, then the problem is going to be that somebody's going to literally slip in under your radar. That's literally. exactly right. Exactly yes. right. That but doesn't happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Okay, so we've got the same diagram. And if I zoom in. We've got the F-16 at 10,000 feet again. The red line extending out here is the bottom of the radar detection um, zone. So that's also at 10,000 feet and that extends horizontally to 40 miles. Okay, so we're all the way to here. And obviously it's, set, it's um, detecting um, 10,000 feet um, and everything within 30 degrees upwards as well. So anything flying in this zone here should be detected. So 
again if we zoom in I've drawn another F16 here at 10,000 feet however the, de the bottom of the detection zone from the other F16 is here and that measurement happens to be 1066 feet so he would not be detected by the radar of the other F-16. This guy would not be detected. He'd be 1,066 feet lower than the bottom of the detection pattern, even though he is flying at 10,000 feet. The horizon, from the perspective of the other F-16, is here. And that is 1.24 miles below the um, bottom of the detection pattern the detection zone so it's way out okay so let's move closer and see how far this f16 can get to this f16 before he gets detected by the radar well again he's still at 10,000 feet here and he's still below the bottom of the detection zone here and that is 4.4 miles I actually think he could go a little bit closer his the tail isn't quite touching the the bottom of the zone yet so he could actually go in I don't know maybe around here somewhere so you could probably get in an extra what half a mile or so and what makes this even crazier is that he is way above the horizon. So at 4.4 miles, he's easily within visual range of this F-16. But he's way above the horizon, yet not being detected by the lowest part of the radar. I mean, it's, it's a double debunking there. And in anticipation of the argument of refraction that's likely to come back, um, I would say that refraction is uh, a ever-changing, dynamic um, phenomenon that cannot be accurately relied upon for radar operations. Um, this Electronic Warfare Fundamentals document that I found online, um, easily downloadable if you want to find it, um, it goes into a section um, and this is talking all about refraction. So I'm going to go through this because some of it's quite interesting. So as altitude increases, the barometric pressure and water vapor content decrease rapidly. At the same time, the absolute temperature decreases slowly based on the standard lapse rate using equation that it can be seen that the refractivity of the atmosphere decreases with increasing altitude. This decrease in refractivity means that the velocity of RF waves increases with altitude. The result is a downward bending or refraction of RF waves as depicted in figure 210, which is this one. Uh, RF wave refraction primarily affects ground based radar systems at low antenna elevation angles. Okay, so it's mainly for ground based radar systems, uh, especially at or near the horizon. For most radar applications, Refraction is not a factor at elevations above 5 degrees. The term um, anomalous or non-standard propagation is used to describe atmospheric conditions that extend the propagation of RF waves and increase radar range. The most common anomalous propagation phenomena is called super refraction or ducting. So a, a super refracting duct is formed when the refractivity of the atmosphere rapidly decreases with altitude. Based on equation that, this occurs when the temperature increases with altitude and or the water vapor content decreases with altitude. An increase in temperature with altitude is called a temperature inversion. To produce a duct, the temperature inversion must be very pronounced. So it's saying that these have to be very specific um, conditions for these ducts to occur. Um, a super refracting duct acts like a waveguide which traps the RF wave. 
This channels the radar signal and reduces attenuation. In order for an RF wave to propagate within a duct, the angle of the radar signal in relation to the duct should be less than one degree. Very specific. The RF waves trapped by the duct take advantage of the, de of the decrease in refractivity and travel much further than normal. This can greatly extend the range of a radar system. Now this picture here that they've, they've drawn, this is showing the radar on the ship and it looks like the, the signal is going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. What I find intriguing about this is that how the heck can the elevation of anything within this range be known if the, if the pattern is going up and down like this? It's just nonsensical to me. Anyway, reading on. The extension of radar range inside a duct can result in a reduction of radar coverage outside the duct. The area of reduced radar coverage because of ducting is called a radar hole. Due to radar holes, the extended radar range caused by ducting may result in a decrease in radar coverage along other paths of propagation. These holes can seriously degrade the effectiveness of early warning radar systems. For example, a radar system is taking advantage of a duct formed at the surface to extend low altitude radar range. Airborne targets flying just above the duct would normally be detected, but because of ducting, these targets may be missed. Water vapour content is a significant factor in producing ducts. Consequently, most ducts are formed over water and in warm climates. Any atmospheric phenomenon that results in a pronounced increase in temperature and or a decrease in water vapour content as altitude increases can generate a super refracting duct, of which there are three types. A super refracting duct, which is formed just above the surface of the earth, is referred to as a surface duct. A surface duct formed just above the surface of the ocean is called an evaporation duct. A duct which is formed well above the surface of the earth is known as an elevated duct. Surface ducts form over land are usually a result of the nighttime radiation of heat from the earth. <laughs> Again, this is time dependent. Duct formation is especially prevalent during the summer months when the ground is moist. As the earth loses heat, a temperature inversion is created at the surface coupled with a sharp decrease in the moisture content. These conditions are favourable to the, to the formation of a surface duct. A super refracting duct can also be produced by the diverging downdraft under a thunderstorm. <laughs> Again, another very specific condition. The cool air that is dispersed creates a local temperature inversion while the water vapour content decreases due to rain. Surface ducts formed in conjunction with thunderstorms are difficult to predict and normally persist for a short period of time. A super refracting duct that lies just above the surface of the ocean is a result of evaporated water, thus the term evaporation duct. The air in contact with the ocean is saturated with water vapour, while the air several feet above the ocean contains a much lower level. This rapid decrease in water vapour pressure with an increase in altitude creates an evaporation duct. An evaporation duct exists over the ocean almost all the time. <laughs> so you can see further than you should be able to over the ocean all the time. The height of this duct varies from 20 to 100 feet based on the season, time of day and wind speed. One positive aspect of an evaporation duct is the extended range available to a ship-borne radar system with a properly aligned antenna. This extended range coverage uh, against surface ships and low altitude aircraft is a definite advantage of ducted propagation. An elevated duct is generally formed by a temperature inversion in the upper atmosphere. To take maximum advantage of the increased radar range inside an elevated duct, both the radar and the target should be inside the elevated duct. In addition, radar systems operating below an elevated duct may also experience enhanced range performance. And then this number four here sums it all up, I think. So the presence of surface ducts and elevated ducts, especially over land, are extremely difficult to predict and may persist for very short periods of time. The atmospheric conditions favourable to duct formation are difficult to predict using conventional weather forecasting techniques. And there you have it. There's no way that 
that can accurately rely upon um, super refracting ducts for radar operations. This is a follow on from my last video uh, where I featured Mike, a retired F-16 pilot, um, and he was contemplating some of the anomalies that he now realizes when he thinks back to his um, pilot days um, with the radar systems and in particular how they would work on a globe. So I want to follow on from that video and just expand on it a bit more. Now this, this isn't anything to do with over the horizon radar. Nothing that I'm going to be talking about is blocked by any curvature. This is all line of sight stuff, even on a globe. Um, but the, the elevations that the aircraft are flying at is intriguing and how the radar systems actually determine what elevation that these aircraft are flying at. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to let this um, guy from a radar integration systems design company. I just want to let him talk about the basics of radar first, so we get a bit of a, a grounding on how exactly it works. Hello, this is Roger Hosking, and today we're going to present a radar tutorial which gives some of the basics of how radars work. What is radar? Radar is an acronym for radio detection and ranging. As you may know, electromagnetic waves reflect off objects like light rays reflect off a reflective surface. Radars send out pulse signal and look for a reflected return signal pulse. And you probably also know that radar signals, because they're electromagnetic signals, travel at the speed of light or 300 kilometers per second. The time it takes for a reflected signal to return back to the antenna is twice the distance divided by the speed of light. But useful radars also need to detect the target location, not just the distance. And advanced radars can detect multiple targets, the speed, the heading, the size, as well as the identity of the target craft and perhaps even the country it's from. The next radar we'll look at is called monopulse radar. It locates a target with a single radar pulse, and it uses a multi-element receive antenna. Three signals are delivered from the antenna down to the radar processing system. The first is the sigma, or sum signal, that is the summation of all of the four different patches. The second is the delta A, which is the delta azimuth, which subtracts A1 minus A2 and signal. And the delta E is the delta elevation, which is E1 minus E2. Those three signals go down to a signal processing engine that calculates the phase shift between the main sigma, or sum signal, and the delta A signal. That allows you to determine a very accurate azimuth angle of the target. And the phase shift between the sum and the delta E signal determines the accurate, a very accurate elevation angle. Okay, I'm going to try and draw what's going on here in AutoCAD with these antennas. So we've got a jet aircraft here. We've got the antenna represented by this white line here in the nose. E1 and E2 are the two elevation receivers. And the white line coming out here represents the center line of the antenna. And that is perpendicular to the antenna itself. So that's the reference point for the antenna. It knows exactly where 90 degrees is. So the purple lines represent the beam and they obviously diverge as they um, get towards the target. So if we zoom right out now, I've drawn another aircraft at 40 miles away. I'll zoom right out. And obviously the beam continues to get larger, but at 40 miles, we've got a target just here. Now obviously the target is above the center line of the beam angle. So the purple lines represent the pulses hitting this target and it hits just here and a return pulse is generated and this returns in this direction represented by these lines here and these, these lines are 90 degrees to the return pulse. So if we zoom out you can see that the return pulse is kind of looks parallel to the 
um, the centre line, but further we get out, you can see it's getting closer and closer. And if we go back to the antenna, we've got these return yellow pulses here, which are 90 degrees to the centre line of the line to the target. And when they get to the antenna, you see the yellow line here, it's obviously going to hit E1 before this same pulse hits E2 here because it's closer to it. Now the, the distance, the physical distance between E1 and E2 is known. So using simple trigonometry, you can determine um, the angle of elevation to the target. Now you'll note that this has to be incredibly precise. You can see how we're talking nanoseconds here. It's going to hit this one's going to hit there nanoseconds before this one. Okay, so a slight in, inaccuracy in the angles here, and it's not going to work. It's going to give errors. Here I've taken a snapshot of some of the different angles in which a pilot can set his antenna in order to scan a particular section of the sky. These are typical upper and lower elevation limits based on a maximum range of 40 nautical miles. These limits are displayed here. Let's say the jet is flying at 10,000 feet and the pilot tilts the antenna to achieve this position. The upper portion continues to grow with increased range, but the bottom remains at the altitude of the aircraft, i.e. 10,000 feet. In this situation, the radar will not detect anything below 10,000 feet. So up to now, everything's been intuitive, logical. You can see how it works. The radar is essentially a angle measuring device, much like a sextant, except it measures uh, angles to physical objects rather than the luminaries. And it can also measure azimuth as well as elevation. But essentially, it's just a, a tool to measure angles. Now let's start to introduce globe geometry into the mix and things start getting real crazy to the point where I'm not even sure what it is they're claiming that happens. Um, probably you'll be as confused as I am by, by the end of this. So there are two main problems as I see it. One is the drop due to curvature and the other is the ever-changing atmospheric conditions in the region between the antenna and the target. OK, let's deal with the drop due to earth curvature first. So we've got an example here. The blue is the earth curvature drawn to exact scale, 3,959 miles. If I zoom in to here, we've got one aircraft. He's going to be doing the detecting. So his antenna is sending out a signal represented by the purple line. Um, and he's at 10,000 feet. So his signal, the bottom of his signal, is also at 10,000 feet. OK, we've got another aircraft here also at 10,000 feet, just here. So obviously the bottom limit of the radar here is above this aircraft. So theoretically it shouldn't detect it. The only way that um, the other aircraft would be able to detect this one would be if he was to lower his antenna beam by one bar. So let's do that. The aircraft here is now within the beam signal, so theoretically would be detected. However, he is 1.82 miles lower than the 10,000 feet uh, mark displayed on the radar screen within this aircraft. So some sort of exponential function would need to be included within the calculation at the radar processing stage for this to be able to be calculated and for the for the correct elevation to be shown on the radar screen for the pilot. I would suggest that something like the 8 inches per mile squared or something similar should be input into the processing system for it to be calculated. All that goes out the window however when you do an image search um, for super refracting duct. This is what comes up. What they appear to be saying is that the signals are bent all the time and the degree in which they're bent are divided into three classifications super refraction, standard refraction and sub refraction but essentially all of them 
are bending the radar signals. So super refraction is used to explain why some objects that are beyond the curvature and should not normally be seen are seen by the radar. Now super refraction follows the curvature of the earth. So signals will be sent over the curvature of the earth and if you look at this one here you'll see that it creates what they call a duct this one's a super refracting duct and the signal is trapped within this super refracting duct and that's how it can get around the curvature of the earth and see things that would normally be blocked okay normal refraction so in normal conditions the signal's being bent up okay away anything higher than super refraction is normal I guess but the point is it's being bent up away from the earth and then super refraction is obviously even further okay so let's focus on this image produced by the US Navy let's say that this is an aircraft flying at 10,000 feet and anything along this dotted line here is also at 10,000 feet which one of these conditions is more in line with this. I would suggest it's super refraction. And I would also suggest that super refraction must be occurring 100% of the time for a radar to function correctly. But that isn't correct because, as referenced here, the presence of surface ducts and elevated ducts, especially over land, are extremely difficult to predict and may persist for very short periods of time. The atmospheric conditions favourable to duct formation are difficult to predict using conventional weather forecasting techniques. So there you have it. Super refracting ducts, or super refraction, is only invoked to explain why some objects are able to be detected beyond the horizon and are not a normal occurrence. So let's say it's a normal day, no super refraction going on, no super refracting ducts, um, no line of sight issues, there's nothing being blocked by any curvature. We've got a target here that's 10,000 feet in altitude. And using the example from earlier of 120 miles, so this distance is 120 miles, we had a 1.82 mile drop. Yes, that's miles nearly two miles of drop here okay to the target so what they seem to be saying is that under normal conditions the signal is being bent upwards so we've already got a 1.82 mile problem here but the signal is bent, being bent up and away under normal conditions what i'm saying is that only during super refracting conditions can this target or any target along this dotted line be seen and an accurate elevation angle determined? But then again, even that's wrong. You can't actually get an accurate elevation if you've got bendy radar signals. And here's why. I've drawn an example using super refraction. So the bottom of the radar signal now is following the curve of the Earth exactly, 10,000 feet. The top is also being curved and then I've drawn a centre line which is the halfway point between those two lines all going all the way back to the, uh, the aircraft here. So again I've placed another target aircraft here so let's say that the beam represented by the purple line here reflects off the aircraft and sends out a return pulse, this yellow one. So at that particular point on this line, this pulse intersects this line, so it's perpendicular. But because this is a curved line, every single point along here is going to be a different angle until this angle now is different to what it was back at the target aircraft. And I'll show you an example of this because I've taken a screenshot. This screenshot is from the target aircraft end. And if I put it next to this one, you can see that the angle is different now. The implications being that when this pulse here hits the, the two receive antennas, this angle is going to be different to the angle in which it actually was reflected 
from the target aircraft. So it's absolutely no use whatsoever. The radar system could not possibly calculate what that angle was. But that's under super refracting conditions. And normally that doesn't occur. That's just odd occurrences when the weather permits. So normal conditions then, what I've done here is I've I've rotated everything up very slightly. So this the bottom part here is no longer following the um, curvature of the Earth. It's up. Everything's gone up very slightly. Well, it doesn't really help matters in terms of detecting anything. Um, you've still got the bent lines. The return pulses are still going to be at a different angle to what they were when they were reflected off the target aircraft. But you've also got the added problem now that because it's gone up, the aircraft here flying at 10,000 feet, which should be absolutely no problem to detect, it cannot be detected because the bottom part of the beam has been refracted upwards due to normal atmospheric conditions. Up to now, I've been humouring the notion of bendy radar signals. The truth is that once a pulse has left the antenna, it has no idea of the conditions out ahead of it. It doesn't know whether the atmosphere is refracting, super refracting or sub refracting and therefore any data fed back to the signal processing system is pretty meaningless. Okay after saying all that there is a way that all of these problems go away. The elevation angles work, we don't need to worry about refraction, we don't need to worry about targets being seen beyond the curvature everything works perfectly and that is on a flat earth. Now I know that will trigger some people and if you are one of those people um, I invite you to show me exactly how radar systems detect elevations of other aircraft on a globe using similar methodology to what I'm using here. Um, if you haven't got AutoCAD then you're welcome to come on a Skype call with me and you can run me through it. I can draw everything um, and you can explain to me exactly how it works with, you know, these two elevation antennas and how they can measure angles from um, bendy signals. And, and I'd also like it backing up with citation as well, because this sort of thing must have been thought about, surely, if um, we do live on a globe.